I've talked in the past about the US Navy's Naval Aircraft Factory, which was created in 1917 to help design and build aircraft suitable for maritime use. Indeed, I've already covered one of their most famous and enduring creations, the NAF N3N. The reason for the NAF being built was because the United States Army Air Service at the time was generating the largest contracts for aircraft development and building, which naturally caught the attention and efforts of the aviation companies. This in turn left the US Navy's far more modest requirements tending to be overlooked or completely ignored, hence the need for their own design and building capability, at least until the end of the First World War when suddenly the private corporations decided they did want to build the Navy's planes after all. With the rapidly expanding aviation companies, names that were going to become giants such as Boeing and Curtis, competing to build the Army's aircraft for them, you would think that this service would be content to allow private venture to do the work. But you'd be wrong. The US Army's Corps of Engineers has a long and proud tradition of innovation, and so around the same time that the Navy were set up their aircraft factory, the US Army created the Engineering Division of the Aviation Section. This was to investigate foreign aircraft designs that the US was then using and see about improving them, especially with American-made components. And in those early years, they also had a crack at designing their own aircraft, leading to today's topic. The Engineering Division TP-1 and XCO-5. The original idea was to build for the US Army Air Service a new high-performance two-seat fighter with better armament than the ones then in service. The single TP-1 built, which first flew in 1923, was a biplane design but with the unusual feature of having the upper wing being of smaller span and cooled than the lower one, a reversal of usual practice. Armament was also comparatively heavy, with the TP-1 being fitted with twin machine guns forward firing for the pilot, a pair of Lewis gun pintle mounted on the back seat and operated by the observer, and a single Lewis fired through a hatch in the bottom of the aircraft. The design was powered by a Liberty 12 engine, which produced 423 horsepower, a very specific number, but that's what all the sources seem to state. Unfortunately, the powerful engine and somewhat unconventional design meant little in terms of the aircraft's performance. Handling was apparently not very good, and with a top speed of 129 miles per hour, the TP-1 was thought to be too slow to be useful and ideas of production abandoned. With mounting political pressure from lobbying by the aviation companies to protect their business, it was to be the final fighter designed and built by the US Army itself. But it wasn't going to be wasted, and the aircraft was fitted with an experimental turbocharger, with which it set several payload-to-height records in 1924. However, the records of the second prototype were to exceed those of the first. Changed while in production to be an experimental high-altitude research aircraft, the XC-05 was fitted with substantially enlarged wings to provide the necessary lift for high-altitude operations, and a supercharged engine. This was reported as being capable of producing the same amount of horsepower at 32,000 feet as at sea level, but those early experimental engines proved unreliable in this regard. On the 29th of January 1926, Lieutenant John McCready took off in the new aircraft looking to seize back the absolute high record for a single crewed aircraft that he had originally taken in 1921, but lost two years later. The flight started well enough, with the high lift wings lifting the XC-05 into the air in a mere 50 feet. Unfortunately, at 25,000 feet, the supercharger's pressure began to drop, and McCready found the aircraft losing power as it continued to climb. Despite his best efforts, he only managed a top altitude during the flight of 38,704 feet. This was 883 feet lower than the existing world record, so McCready didn't reclaim his crown, but he did establish a new United States national altitude record. I mean, this in a biplane with the pilot having to wear what was practically a prototype spacesuit made of leather, fur and bottled oxygen, so I feel credit for the bravery of these early pioneers really does need more recognition. On inspection, the supercharger was found to have developed a crack which caused the pressure problem, 
and once repaired the XC05 was all set for more record breaking attempts. In 1928, Captain Albert Stevens, commander of the Aerial Photography Unit at Wright Field, approached his friend, the daring test pilot and explorer, Captain Bill Street, to ask him to help Stevens prove a theory of his. Stevens thought he could more accurately determine the altitude an aircraft had reached by taking pictures from it of set points on the ground. The idea was this might prove a better method than the then used barometric pressure sensors, the reliability of which were subject to a fair bit of argument. On the 10th of October 1928, the two took off in the XC05 to test the idea. Obviously, operating at such high altitude in a largely open aircraft required special consideration, and along with specially insulated flight suits with full face masks for breathing oxygen, Stevens had his specially built and electrically warmed camera, as well as electrically heated gloves so his hands didn't freeze while taking the photographs. In addition, Street, anticipating some of the problems they might face, drilled small holes in his goggles so that if they froze up, he would still be able to see something, which as the lowest temperature they recorded on the flight was minus 60 degrees centigrade. Well, it got pretty chilly. As Street later put it, cold up there? You don't know what 76 Fahrenheit below zero feels like until you've been there. As it turned out, despite all their precautions, it almost wasn't enough. Street took the XC05 up to as high as it would literally get, which took an hour and 40 minutes, and then held it there while Stevens took the shots he needed. But when Street tried to cut the engine, nothing happened. The controls had frozen, effectively trapping the two men in the stratosphere. Street tried to dive the XC05 down, but knew that the fragile aircraft wasn't built for that sort of manoeuvre, and that if he pushed it, he would tear the wings off. And as soon as he took the pressure off, the XC05 did what it was designed to do, and bobbed back up to the maximum altitude its big wings could sustain. Street and Stevens now had to wait it out, and hope that their oxygen didn't run out before the engine's petrol did. Fortunately for the intrepid pair, the engine supply ran out after about 20 minutes and the XC05 gradually drifted down to earth. Street admitted that he didn't have a clue where they were by this point and as his goggles were frozen solid, his only view was limited to the holes he had cut in them. Street was able to put the XC05 down in a field, despite the aircraft having no engine and at these low altitudes, in the words of Captain Stevens, handling like a barn door a feat of airmanship that was widely recognised as exceptional. But not finished there, Street went out, scrounged up some fuel, and finding the throttle controls had unfrozen, the two men flew back to their base near Dayton, Ohio. Stevens' photographic calculations showed that the XC-05 had reached an altitude of 39,250 feet, while the US Bureau of Standards calculated from the barographic instruments carried on the flight that they had ceilinged at 39,000, 606 feet. These figures were only marginally below the absolute height record of the time for a single person aircraft, a pretty remarkable feat. Unfortunately, though this was undoubtedly the true altitude record for a two manned aircraft at the time, it remained unofficial because the rules required the aircraft return directly to its launch airfield to prevent tampering with the monitoring equipment. But though not officially recognised, it remains a remarkable flight both for the two crewmen, who went on to other achievements, and the XC-05, which was soon to be replaced by a more advanced aircraft, which benefited from the experience that aircraft had given in cutting-edge flight research.